Good morning, evening, afternoon to, to everyone. Thanks for, for being here. It's great to see so many folks. So, so Dimitri and I are gonna blow through as fast as we can. We got a lot to cover. Uh, there's a lot of new things in Snowflake. Uh, hopefully some of you got to see our Cloud Data Summit yesterday and we're gonna try to relate some of that stuff to, uh, to uh, Data Vault and um, how you might take advantage of some of these features in Snowflake if you're using a Data Vault architecture. So I'm gonna start off with a, a quick recap of uh, Data Vault on Snowflake so far and then we will get into the Snowflake new capabilities and then talk specifically about the, introduce you all to the data cloud concepts and how I see that fitting in with uh, the data vault architecture. Now, um, this is what we've blogged about and talked about, and I just realized I spelled hubs wrong on this. I was typing too fast last night. Just as what we've done in the prior ones, talking about using multiple virtual warehouses, uh, for loading the hubs and links and sats in parallel, multi-cluster warehouse for automatic scaling, uh, using a variant to load JSON data directly into a satellite. And uh, by the way, the use case that I've always been talking about is a company called Passion in Southern California. And we did actually publish the case study now on the uh, Snowflake site on our resources page. You can find that and I tweeted about it over the last couple of weeks. It talks a little bit about the, the time savings they've had with taking this approach with Data Vault and our variant on uh, Snowflake. Uh, we've talked about using views for business vaults and information marts, multi-table insert, and uh, using multiple databases or schemas to secure sensitive data. Now, one uh, existing feature that we hadn't talked about, I'm just gonna do a quick run through of this is our materialized views. And this comes from a uh, data modeling meetup that I was on a month or so ago where one of our customers was talking about this, that they're using uh, materialized views to build business vault objects. Um, uh, and this is one of the places you can go. Now in Snowflake, we only build materialized views on single tables and what he was actually doing is the third bullet here is taking the key elements from a variant on a satellite and doing a materialized view on each satellite based on their requirements and sort of a, a just in time thing. And that's what he was doing to get the performance that he needed. Apparently he had some very, very large satellites. Um, and so instead of just doing views in this case, he did materialized views to show the attributes on those satellites. And you know, in my mind, that effectively is then part of the business vault. And as they're building out information marts, they're actually using those materialized views as the, the point of reference rather than the, the raw vault views. Uh, the other place you can use materialized views would be pre-aggregated satellites. So if there's just a lot of rows with a lot of deltas and you need to do aggregations for some KPI or key metrics, that's also a good place for, uh, for using materialized views. Or certainly uh, if you only want the most recent view, which is what I've always been recommending through views using the lead function. Uh, again, if the performance is not, because you have just so much data and so many changes on a regular basis that you, the performance is just not there using uh, scaling up the, the warehouses, the virtual warehouses in Snowflake, then you could consider using materialized views for that. And because of the fact we have the now serverless automatic uh, materialized view refresh, then the data is automatically kept up to date. So this is kind of like your low code ETL option. Oops, so I'll go back to there. And so uh, at this point, I'm actually gonna turn over to Dimitri and he's gonna run you through some of the uh, new and upcoming features that we, we just announced here in the last couple of days. So, uh, Dimitri, do you want me to stop sharing and switch to you, or do you want me to run the slides for you? Um, if you don't mind, go for, let's go with the, you running the slides, if, you, if that's okay, or I'll try to request the control um, from your yeah, side. you just did. Fantastic. Hope it's gonna work. Um, okay, sounds good. So, um, Snowflake just did um, our annual summit, uh, at which our product team did a series of a like, great announcement in terms of the new capabilities that are going to be available for you immediately after, as well as in the short term, but also 
shared some of the insights or where we are leading in the more middle term or long term horizon. And I believe this is something that we are super excited to share with you guys as well. Uh, thank you. Brilliant, thanks. Um, so what we are gonna talk about today is some of the features that are helping and improving the experience of you working alongside all of those workloads. And just as a reminder, Snowflake is not just the data warehouse, right? We are bringing a lot, a lot of um, capabilities to improve your data engineering, your data lake, your data science. Uh, we are a great platform to build data applications on and you have unique value proposition in terms of connecting all the data through data sharing replication across the globe, across multiple clouds into what we call now a data cloud. So, yeah, uh, in terms of like the features that we wanted to talk you through today and some of them being announced yesterday, we'll start with the serverless task, which is here at the bottom left. And in order to talk about that, I'd say we're probably gonna quickly over, uh, do a quick overview of what the, the continuous data pipelines um, is in, in a nutshell. So Snowflake is allowing you to, I hope, okay, good, so there's a bit of an animation, sorry for that. It's allowing you and, and is providing you multiple ways to integrate data into Snowflake, right? You have the synchronous way of copying data in, you have the Snowpipe, which is a serverless way to auto ingest data um, as it arrives in your in your external buckets, as well as we have the integration with Kafka. But that is very well covering the data, the initial data ingestion. And then for many, many customers, um, it was super appealing to leverage our continuous data pipelines capabilities through orchestrating the data transformation from that stage and landing table all the way through multiple layers in your architecture until it's ready for you to connect by BI or reporting tools and start making sense of that data. So tasks and streams is uh, the concept, is the object that are managed by Snowflake for you. Um, and just, just to give you a better view of the streams, uh, which is one of the components of that, of that puzzle, Stream is effectively a, a change log that you're defining on top of the table. And then for each of the changes, like you inserted a new record, you're updating a record, you're deleting a record, you would see that CDC change log in your stream assigned to that table. You can have multiple streams uh, attached to the same table. You can have um, consumers than connecting and reading data from that stream instead of accessing the original table to detect what, what was the change since the last time you kind of work with the data set. This is the super efficient way to identify the deltas. And for many um, customers leveraging data vault architecture, this was a great way to do the incremental drip feeding um, integration into the data vault. And as a way to then actually move the data from the stream to hubs, links, and satellites or to your data mods, what you then do is you have a task that is uh, effectively uh, an executable pointed to either self-contained in a SQL statement, like insert from select from the stream, or pointed to one of the stored procedures that is described in your data pipeline step. And that could have run based on the interval. So you have the flexibility of the cron scheduler but maintained and, and, and supported by, by Snowflake database. You can have the preprocessor uh, when one task could be involved by completion of another task. And also, of course, there is a, a possibility to trigger it when the stream has new data in it. So that was great. However, Snowflake just did tasks even better. Um, now, on top of what you can do, you, instead of managing your compute for running the tasks, Snowflake is now supporting the view the ability to delegate the management and sizing of the virtual warehouses that are used by the tasks to Snowflake serverless um, services similar to what you do with Snowpipe. And 
Why that is important is that going back to this diagram, you no longer need to spin up and down the virtual warehouses each time you run the task or transformation. And while from Snowflake any anyway, that operation is super easy, completely automated in multiple occasions, but when you integrate in a very small increments of data into your data vault or your data warehouse, that may come up at the price because starting up the virtual warehouse is effectively uh, consuming at least 60, 60 seconds of running this virtual warehouse time. With continuous data pipelines being extended to serverless tasks, that uh, financial model would be much more efficient even if you're integrating data via very small grid feed, similar like um, Snowpipe is, uh, is doing that job for um, auto ingest. Now, I don't know why the remote control is a bit struggling. Now, moving to another feature that is, I'm super excited about. This is external functions. And this is something that we actually announced back in June, but now it's again getting through the maturity and getting more and more popularity. This cap self capability is providing you a way to extend your data pipelines that are happening within Snowflake SQL, transform your data all the way again from the raw format until it's ready for querying, um, in, uh, but, but also leverage the external services that you may have to enrich that data. And as a couple of examples, it could be your ML service, a scoring service that is deployed, for example, in uh, AWS SageMaker that you can now invoke and call um, to again transform your record that you, you are loading into the next table through SQL by Snowflake calling AWS API Gateway, calling um, Amazon SageMaker and then writing that result back in a database. All super easy to maintain, all super easy to extend. And at the moment uh, we are in a public preview of this feature. It is available on AWS and Azure and GCP, similar functionality on GCP is coming down the line. Uh, the next uh, feature is a, a bunch of enhancements on what do we do in our data governance space. And this is becoming a super important topic for all of us, I'm sure. So again, going back to the announcement that was done, I think, in, in June earlier this year, we started with introducing the ability for you to leverage dynamic data masking instead of implementing um, multiple views hiding different parts of um, of your data for for your different consumers depending depending on the role that they are using. Now with Snowflake, it is much easier to do as an administrator. You are defining a set of attributes set of columns, set of tables on which you wanted to enforce dynamic data masking rules. You are defining uh, the criteria and the actual formula for hiding the sensitive subsets of data. So it could be partial like in this example. Alex uh, here has access only to the four last digits of the phone number and completely doesn't have access to SSN. Um, you in total control of what's hidden, how it's hidden, and what's quite good comparing this to like the workarounds that I'm sure everyone was doing before is it is integrated with all parts of Snowflake. So for example, if you're using zero copy cloning for your um, SDLC environment management, that is gonna be still applied. So your guarantee is that you're not exposing yourself at risk to if you're allowing your developers to do zero copy cloning on, from production data. And now just to so this would be that's re, this is really useful for uh, business vault really so you can just have one layer of business vault views on top of the raw vault and applying the governance rules at that point right yep and just complementing the similar story where we are allowing our users to define this dynamic data masking or columnar data masking we are announcing uh, the functionality to for you to define the role access policies as well which is again super easy super flexible to configure based on the rules and the policy you define and the lookup table that is going to be next to the like the fact table or 
uh, table you have in your business world. And there will be a rule that is again applied throughout Snowflake stack. So you're guaranteed that regardless which tools you are using, um, which applications you are connected to Snowflake, the role and column level security is always is always in place and is always enforced, which is definitely a pattern we wanted to, you to, to go with. And finally, just to make it even more robust, we are announcing the possibility for you to introduce the object tagging. And this is actually the approach that um, some of our customers were using even, even before it became a part of the product by adding um, semi-structured tagging into uh, the commentary field of your views, columns, tables, databases, effectively you were able to put um, the JSON yourself and then use queries to um, semi-structured query access to work with the data dictionary. Now it is becoming a part of the product. So the admin is creating the tags for you and then as data owner you can attach those tags to series of different types of uh, all database objects all the way to the individual columns. And again, why that is super exciting and super important is that that tagging could be integrated with both column and overall level security. So you would be able to identify and tag the data and use that tagging to many, many use cases, guaranteeing that data governance is not just like a selective thing, it's going throughout your stack. Cool. Um, just just trying to accelerate because, as, as Kent mentioned, we have a lot to cover here. The next part I wanted to quickly talk about is the whole Snowpark and the Java functions um, capabilities. So Snowflake is on the journey to become even more inclusive. So you know that we used to say that Snowflake is a super portable platform that is integrated with any tools you really wanted to use as well as any skills that you have in your existing teams. Um, Snowflake just get better, right? So in the past, majority of your calculations needs to be, were, were required to be expressed in SQL. Now we are announcing the support of Scala and Java. Um, and I think it is super hard to just visualize what it would actually mean in terms of um, how, it, how it actually works. I, I definitely suggest everyone to just go and uh, have a look on the presentation that Shri did during our Cloud Summit event. We, we will be happy to supply links um, as a follow-up. Uh, but it was super exciting that you now can use the development tools that you used to, you now can use data frames approach for expressing your data transformation and data pipelines. You now can bring Java code to work in Snowflake virtual warehouses and leverage um, Snowflake elasticity and scalability without any time, of course, sacrificing security governance or any other constraints. And it, it, it's done brilliantly in terms of there is no Spark SQL in between. It is uh, if we are talking about Snowpark in particular and Scala interpretation, that is something that is happening on the client side, transformed transparently from, from you into SQL and then executed with, with, with all the features and all the possibilities that Snowflake provides. Super excited about that. So SQL, Java, Scala are going to be available just around the corner. Python is something that the engineering team are working on, um, but we definitely see it's coming. Ken, anything you wanted to add? No, nothing on this one. Cool. Now, in terms of the last box here, the core capabilities, this is where I'm super excited that the engineering team is continuing to hear from the ground, continuing to innovate, um, and they see across the board and, and introducing improvements across the board. So one of the metrics that they were sharing, and I think this is something that is impacting all of us, regardless what tools we use, which approaches we use, and what frameworks we imply, 
is that they managed to improve about 72% of the queries above one second compilation time to at least 50%. Which is, in my opinion, super great, and I know that this is just the beginning of the journey, and there will be much more improvements going on soon. And in in, in combination of that and pay for what you use per second uh, billing model or utility model, as we call it, this is a super important improvement that I'm really really happy that the product is doing. Yeah, and, and that was with using the same number of compute resources. So the importance here is where people are building uh, data vault architectures using views uh, for business vaults and information marts is that we're looking at even having even better query performance than what we've been getting, uh, which is gonna maybe mean some, some of the folks that are right on the edge of, well, maybe I need to actually materialize my information mart on my data vault in Snowflake, they might not have to and it's it's not going to cost them more it's actually just the queries are going to be faster for um, using the same size virtual warehouses which means if they're faster that means it actually costs you less so this is really exciting for this particular architecture and as we are um, uh, pushing forward i'm seeing a lot of customers who are using this kind of virtual information mart virtual business vault approach on snowflake that this is going to make it you know, fit even even more customers to be able to do it effectively and cost efficiently. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, the another improvement that uh, that's been announced is the big level up to our source optimization service. So this is something that again was in the private in in the public preview starting from June, but back in the day was limited to supporting the eco predicate filtering only. Now, I think we're super excited that um, the engineering is now made available the support of that optimization service to improve your wildcard search. Um, and that is gonna be demonstrated in many workshops and many online sessions during the summit by introducing new changes, how you can do log analysis, how you can work with a pretty broad set of data. And I just wanted to mention that search optimization service is definitely not like the fast equal true parameter in Snowflake. It is one of the optimization techniques that you may employ in certain use cases. It's applied to the whole date, to the whole table, um, and you can do it selectively where you need um, that highly selective uh, lookups to perform even faster in case if the columns you're filtering on are outside of the clustering key and materialized key is potentially not an option. And we see customers usually leveraging from this, applying it to the fairly large tables and improving the performance a lot. And similar to Kent, what, what Kent was describing before, the beauty of that is that it is completely maintained as a serverless operation. So there is no maintenance introduced for you on top of what you currently do. You still can continue to focus on what matters. And then, um, so I'm still struggling with the slide. Uh, Sorry, uh, yeah. So unstructured data is um, another announcement. So back in the day when we were talking about what Snowflake is able to work with, we were more focused, of course, on the structured data being super performant, columnarized, optimized. We then had uh, a great capability to support you bringing in semi-structured data in the raw format for the schema on, on read experience. So we're not just parsing it on the way in, you are allowing you to raw data in our variant columns as is. And as Kent was describing, this is a great way, for example, to use it in your satellites and then extract from semi-structured data only when you need those attributes that you need to. Now we are super excited to start supporting unstructured data as well um, to make your data platform story, your data lake story um, complete with all the benefits, with all the capabilities um, to govern all the data across the board in seamless experience that Snowflake can provide. So I appreciate there is a lot. We uh, can only jump through some of this some of these uh, features very very briefly. But um, in the end, 
I'll be really happy to take any questions as well as we'll share the links to the talk tracks. Um, definitely suggest people to just, just listen in to the product announcements. They were running demos, they were showing it in action. And it is a really, really exciting um, iteration of Snowflake um, development. Kent, over to you. Yeah, it looks like we've got some questions in the chat. Uh, let me see here if I can, I'm just going to go through that all from the Netherlands. Presentations recorded. Okay, how is the security applied to roles based on the user who input it, or do you have to have some type of filtering applied to the table to enforce the security? So this is on the row access. So the answer to that is the latter. Well, it's, it is possible to um, to create a solution where, depending on who like populated certain records. This is also limiting who would be able to see. This is all the tagging mechanism, but essentially the way it works is that it is during the consumption time on the fly is parsing the context of the consumer and being able to identify only the columns and only the records that you're allowed to see. Yeah, and so like you said, it's a, there's gotta be a, um sort of a rules table that goes with this. And uh, for those that are in the Oracle world, this is very much like uh, what we used to call virtual private database in Oracle, right? So it's gonna be based on a, a column in, in your table and the, uh, the controlling governing column and the role of the user. Uh, and do the automatic, will automatically create the right filters, to only show you what you need. Um, on uh, Snowpark, we got Scala, Java, Python, and someone's asking R. Uh, R is not supported right now in Snowpark. It was just Scala and Java today. Is that right, Dimitri? Yeah, it is um, Scala and Java at the moment. I think Python is next on the list. Not sure about the R. I think the nowadays the only way to do that is just through DBC and you're writing the actual SQL snippets in, in R itself. Um, but it's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, external functions, can data travel outside of Snowflake for the external functions? Not sure what um, you mean by that, because you're going to call the external function, right? And you're basically going to pass the Snowflake data to the external function, and it's going to return the result, right? Yeah. This is the way it works. Yeah. So you are receiving back either the enriched value that this function returns or some of the customers are, I think, using that to support the external notification or API calls, for example, in their data cataloging tools to record that the certain pipeline being just successfully completed. Yeah. Uh, are the Java functions akin or parallel to JavaScript UDFs? Uh, they so be, we don't have Java functions. You can use Java in Snowpark, right? And that's a data frame defined by Java. Is that right? Yeah, and you can actually upload some of the jar files as well to be executed in uh, in a warehouse as well in a function. And those are going to coexist with uh, JavaScript UDF. Yeah. So on the tagging, could you, for example, submit tag submitted data by a business unit and not have to create multiple presentation layer objects per business unit in terms of row column data access. Uh, yeah, this is exactly the idea, right? You, you, you tag um, the columns that you, this, you may or may not expose to certain different roles of your breaking down your consumer uh, list of your users and you are defining these rules once and you don't need to create different business business views on top of it. Yeah, so even like the, di I wonder if the, di does dynamic data masking and row access controls be able to read tags then as part yeah. of the, the policies, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, external function, does that mean API calls are possible? And I think that is basically what that means. If you're calling external function, that's really an API call to a service outside of Snowflake, right? Yeah, so, so you can call from Snowflake the external API that sits behind the API gateway. Uh, but it doesn't mean, just to be clear, it doesn't mean that you can call and work with Snowflake via the RESTful API, for example. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, one comment about the materialized views that they saw in the Data Cloud Summit, multiple joins for materialized views are not planned. <laughs> Can I address it with the product team? Well, I have addressed it with the product team, believe me. It, it's come up a couple of times and it's much longer discussion than, than I can certainly have today about uh, at the moment that there, there is no plans. All right, Dimitri, if you uh, have you returned access control to me, if you have, let me see, can I? Yes, okay, I have control. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take back over here. We've only got, uh, ooh, 20 minutes left. So I'm gonna uh, kind of breeze through some of this. I wanna talk about the, the Snowflake data cloud and put that in context for everyone. So um, as was discussed yesterday a lot, and you'll see a lot more online about this, you know, the data cloud is gonna enable three key things, access, governance, and action on your data. And by access, we mean that organizations can discover and share data without physically moving it at the near unlimited scale and uh, that you get with Snowflake, regardless of the format of the data, whether it's structured, semi-structured, or now eventually unstructured. Uh, on the governance side, it means knowing and controlling the data. So all the things that Dimitri was just uh, explaining that we have these features in a way so we can enable collaboration while maintaining a high level of security and compliance, which is, is the, of the utmost importance. And then action meaning you can empower every part of your business with the data they need to, to build better products, make faster decisions, um, create new revenue streams, monetize the data, and really get the, the value out of your, your data assets. Um, now we've got, um, the data cloud is being powered, as you imagine, by the Snowflakes platform, which you all are, are quite familiar with. Um, the special thing uh, about this is that because Snowflake is a single platform and it's offered as a service, and it is cross cloud across all three clouds and global, and it was built specifically for the cloud with the architecture, it really is enabling uh, organizations to have this data cloud approach where you are able to easily share all of this common data and get the performance and scale that we're, you know, we're really looking for. And so key to that is accessing all the data you need to run your business. And in this case, we're talking about the data in your beta, data vault, in your business vault, and your information marks. So this really becomes a seamless experience. And that means you can use, you know, Snowflake with all these different data approaches with semi-structured using variants like we've talked about at this, this scale and collaborate with uh, other parts of your organization or even partner organizations external to your company without having to physically move the data around. And so from a business perspective, that means you can start having seamless access to all the organization's data and eliminating having separate data platforms or even separate physical data marts that had generally been divided by department and geography and things like that. So outside of your organization, it, if you can imagine that you could have instant access to data from uh, your suppliers to drive supply chain efficiencies, uh, business partners to analyze even things like joint go to market campaigns or uh, customers uh, so that you can give them better experiences by collecting customer data more easily. And then really finally, the, the data cloud is gonna give you access to the Snowflake data marketplace. And right now we have over a hundred companies. Uh, they're offering data that you can use to then augment your analytics or augment your data vault with things like weather data and a lot of demographic retail data. There's just, and the COVID data that we've had out there for a couple of months and having that really instantly available all over the world. And all of this is really powered, you know, deeply by our secure data sharing capability. And that's what makes this data cloud thing really work. So accessing the data in the data cloud can be completely frictionless. There's no copying or moving of the data. Um, customers designate data for sharing and grant read permissions to it. And then it looks to the consumers like a read only database. And so that's easy to grant, but it's also easy to revoke. So in keeping with your compliance, and of course now we can talk about all of these, uh, the data, dynamic data masking, uh, the row access controls all being part of this, so it is fully governed. 
and that allows the consumers then to explore and query the data in place and still only see the data they're supposed to see, but they don't have to copy the data. And so we're getting a lot lower latency in um, the time to value with the data because you're not having to do all this transferring around. And because it stays in place in uh, the care of the data provider, it means the data is always up to date. As soon as uh, you update the data in your data share, then everybody who has access to it sees that new data. Um, and so it's, it's really is zero latency from, from that perspective, right? Now there's lots of lots to say and lots of options on secure data sharing technology uh, really kind of breaks into three things. You've got the direct share where you can just grant access to a share to another Snowflake account. And that could be another account in your company or it could be you know, a completely separate company altogether. As long as they have a Snowflake account, you can grant them read access and nobody has to move the data. Then you have the data exchange, which allows you to set up kind of a walled garden where you pick and choose and grant access to a group of Snowflake accounts to a predefined, really it's an internal marketplace. So you, you instead of doing a, a direct share of a table or a database or a schema, you're gonna set all of this up ahead of time and then they can, the people you've given privileges to are able to come into this data exchange and request then access to these different data sets. But it's just within, as I said, your kind of private walled garden. And then of course, there's the Snowflake data marketplace where all Snowflake customers have access to the, the data that's been published there. So you can become a data provider and potentially monetize some of your data that is, uh, I'll say, publicly shareable or applicable across multiple industries where others might find value in your data for augmenting their analytics. Um, and on the reverse, you have access to the data marketplace to be able to subscribe to these data sets and get instant access to additional analytics data that may you know, help you in, in doing in your analytics in particular. Now, so there's lots of different ways of doing this and there's, we've got global sharing now. So you can not only replicate data between the different snowflakes in different clouds, whether it's Azure and AWS or Google, uh, so cross cloud replication, but also cross cloud and cross region data sharing. And that's another form of replication uh, with a dynamic data masking policy divided by the provider, then you, which would be you, right? If you own that data, you can, you can specify different actions based on the consumer characteristics. Now, you know, think about how you could replicate or share your, your data vault model data sets this way, right? Uh, with all of the, you know, our link structures and hubs, you know, we've previously talked about being able to separate parts of your data vault into different Snowflake databases, right? And having the, um, you know, the less sensitive data in one database and the sensitive data in another database and having a link over in that database to the non-sensitive, right? To link the sensitive non-sensitive. So now take this to a global level and into a, a marketplace and sort of data, um, you know, app store for data concept here is to be able to actually publish out portions of your data vault, um, whether to, again, through a private exchange or a direct share to you know, other internal organizations or specific business partners. But on the other side, on the consumer side, if they're, if they understand, you know, a data vault approach, you know, they may have their own hubs and links and satellites, and you can easily imagine now they just add in a new link to make that join between their data and your data in the data cloud this way. And really now you start to talk about, think about a global data vault model that's traversing not only companies, but industries, right? Uh, Dan and I have talked about this a, a couple of times. And it's like, you know, what are the monetization uh, opportunities here to do these sorts of things? And really, you know, when it comes down to it, your own, having your own data exchange, that's how you 
you know, you keep that additional layer of governance on it because you're controlling who has access to see your thing, but you're not having to, again, do the direct shares, right? So it eliminates a lot of the maintenance and management uh, where you're basically get a curated list of other Snowflake customers. Like I said, partners, other business units that have their own Snowflake account and just grant them access to the marketplace. And that's where you would then publish your shares, which, you know, a share is just a, you know, in my mind, a curated data mark. But if we're talking data vault, I'm say a curated, you know, business vault. You know, you may want to give someone access to the raw data vault, but more likely it's going to be a business vault view or maybe even an information mark view. But this gives you a lot more opportunities. And I'm thinking really, if you're exposing a data vault model, then uh, with hubs and, and links and satellites, then it's a lot easier for another I'll say data vault savvy organization to build an extended business vault by connecting, by putting in um, links on their side to, to join up to the data that you have now proposed in there. And so when you, when you get um, data from a data exchange or the marketplace, it's available directly like um, in, in the video here and you just, you just run regular queries, just like you would. And we've got lots of stuff out there and there's some examples there on the, uh, on the screen of some of the providers we have today that offer things like risk models uh, coming from, uh, you know, FactSet does a lot of financial data. We've got weather data, all sorts of things out there and, and the COVID data. And that's how it looks. You know, you get in your snowflake and it's like, it just looks like another database. And because of the cross database joining capabilities, you can do this. So again, you know, imagine this with a, a shared data vault model. And that's, you know, to me, um, you know, Cindy Myerson and I talked about this a couple of years ago when we first rolled out data sharing about how useful this could be across um, agencies in, in a government that are trying to keep things more secured and keep it, again, I like the concept of the wall, the garden, of being able to build this out, but still make it really, really easy. So instead of having to move data around and export it from your database into some you know, CSV file and put it on a secured FTP site and have somebody download it and then have to write the ETL to process it and put it, say, into a data vault model in their database, we can just now directly share it, right? And they just see whatever, whatever the schema is that's what they get access to. Let me see here. I think I might have a couple. I've got a couple more questions come up here in the chat. So let me see. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, so going back to Dimitri's one quick one, do we plan to have it for Google Cloud? Yes, Snowflake is available on Google Cloud and all the features that uh, uh, Dimitri was just talking about, you know, all Snowflake features will be available across all three clouds. Um, okay, so another question. Many companies have tons of data on-prem. Are you planning to provide a way to have external tables that are stored in other databases, um, Oracle, for instance, that are either on-prem or in the cloud? So uh, for that, no, not that I know of. We have external tables, and that works specifically for the um, blob storage on the three clouds that you can define external tables there. Uh, you can use a Hive meta store and all of that. But at this point, uh, I have not seen anything about connecting directly to an on-prem database. Though I did see something recently that some folks in the Oracle world have figured out how to reach out um, through some, some mechanism to Snowflake. And so kind of like a DB link from within Oracle where they're able to, they're able to, to query Snowflake. Um, so you're talking about Gluent, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there is an Oracle connector for Snowflake. Okay, uh, thanks, Peter. I, yeah, I knew there was, the, there's OAC now has an Oracle connector, so Oracle's um, cloud reporting tool has a connector for Snowflake. And I think Golden Gate team is in theory working on it. Okay, thank you very much. So that's now in the chat. There's a link for that, uh, for the Oracle Snowflake connector. Good, good. All right. Um, all right, so do we have, you know, uh, uh, just before we go on and open up the full open up for questions here, 
the, the Data Cloud Summit that I've been talking about that happened yesterday, uh, but it's going to be available for replay for quite a long time. Um, and that's the, the website for it, but really if you just go to uh, snowflake.com, you'll be able to find a link there as well. Uh, if you look at my Twitter stream, for those any of you who aren't following me already, it's just Kent Graziano on Twitter. Uh, I was tweeting like a madman yesterday about it. Uh, there are links throughout my Twitter feed for the last probably three weeks going to the Data Cloud site. It was free, it's free to register. You will have to go in and register and then you get access to all of the recordings. And there was like, what, 60 or 70 uh, uh, sessions yesterday. I mean, I, there was, we had eight, like eight tracks going in parallel at one point. So I didn't even get to watch everything that my colleagues did. So I've got a bunch of, uh, a bunch to do to, uh, to, to write this up. Um, okay, another question. Can data exchange marketplace help with avoiding the complex data eventing architectural patterns, which can include bi-directional data weighted down with API? Uh, it is not today, the data sharing is not bi-directional. So as far as not having to use an API, yes, absolutely. We have people in the data marketplace publishing data services now even, um, where it is kind of an API call to, to pull it out, but the data shares themselves are just look like databases. So if you can publish a schema and a data dictionary to go with that, uh, for other people to use. And that's what we've got out there now with like the weather data and all of that. There's sample queries and all, so you can just go, you just start querying it. So you don't need to pull the data, right? You're just gonna write a SQL query to join it to your data and you're done. Um, yeah, data virtualization and, uh, tools, which are essentially caching systems such as Denodo. Um, yes, this is what we're doing with the data cloud and all the data sharing mechanism really, um, gives you the ability to have a globally virtualized data repository, right? And so it, it really, it, it doesn't solve the hybrid cloud thing with the on-prem, right? It does require everything be in the data cloud. And so that's, that's the one caveat, but the reality is other than a few corner cases, every single industry is moving their data to the cloud um, I'm sure there will be some people that will continue to leave some of their data on-prem, but long-term, you're going to see the majority of the data is in the cloud. And once it is in the data cloud, then it can be shared, right, much more easily. And it is effectively, you know, a, a virtualization uh, play, if you will. Yeah, I think the world is definitely changing on that side. I think we've all seen the articles that kept the one recently, just last week, turned off their last managed data center themselves, moving all the workloads to the cloud. So definitely a journey that is happening. I Certainly think. when it comes to analytics and AI and machine learning, this all seems to be going to cloud because for some of those things, we just, we need the compute power, right? And it's just too expensive to build a data center to contain that much compute with the flexibility of systems like Snowflake where you can spin it up and spin it down. And now we've gone, uh, one of the things we didn't mention here, we're up to what, a six XL, right? We added, we had, we used to be four XL was the biggest cluster you could do. And we've added a five XL and a six XL. And we did because we actually had customers who needed that, that were processing so much data that they, in order to do it efficiently and quickly, to achieve their business goals, they needed a 6XL uh, cluster. It just kind of blew a lot of us away, I think. But it's, it, it, the world has changed, it really has, and people are taking advantage of it, and we're seeing people really are getting the value out of, of doing this and having that flexibility. Yeah, I just wanted so I think, to uh, when, real quick, and that I think you mentioned that the bi-direction, the share doesn't work bi-directionally, but at the same time, you can totally create two shares, right? So you can share data with your, I don't know, data processing counterpart, and they share data back to you. So that is absolutely possible. Yeah, yeah. We had a customer, one of the very first sharing customers we had, they were doing that where um, eventually they got acquired by the partner they were sharing with, but they had, one, one of the customers had a huge set of raw data uh, about, I think it was video, YouTube, traffic information, they shared it to a partner 
via data sharing, who then took that, augmented it, and produced a refined result set, and then shared that result set back. And so it was a, a virtuous cycle there where they shared the raw data over their partner, their partner refined it and shared it back because the, um, the folks who had the raw data didn't have the um, engineering skills to do the analytics, to produce the analytics they wanted, but they knew what they needed where their partner had some additional data and was able to do the augmentation and share back um, the, uh, the augmented data with them. So yeah, you can absolutely do that. All right, we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, uh, Neil, any any other questions? No, come back online. Out there. If anyone's got any questions, please type it into the uh, into the chat. Um, we officially finish uh, on the hour, but we do hang around a little bit afterwards if people want to continue the conversation. Okay, so we got one more. Is there impact in lineage analysis across the data sharing capabilities? Uh, we have. There's, I know there's some stuff there already where the data providers can see, you know, how much, it, what data is being used, because that's a common question. It's like, you know, which tables are being accessed, how much is it being accessed, and I know it's, uh, that is actually being augmented right now for even more because of these monetization scenarios. Uh, who pays for the compute costs of running the queries uh, available on the marketplace? The consumer does. And so that's the, the whole data sharing thing is it's, if you remember our architecture is multi-cluster shared data. So the data is stored in one place. Um, the compute though is gonna be on your side. So if you, ha you have read access to a share, that's in your Snowflake account. And so you're going to, you're going to pay for that. Um, there is a couple of scenarios where we have some customers, Athena Health, who was speaking yesterday, where they're using something that we call a reader account and that remains in control of the data provider. And so for uh, the scenario they have where they have all these clinics that they're, they're collecting the data from that are part of the Athena Health Network, um, they are producing the analytics for those individual clinics and making them available through a reader account. So uh, Athena controls that and manages all of that and then they are billing that back then to the individual clinics. So they have a, a subscription process and a contract with the individual clinics where the clinics are effectively, they're paying for the compute, but Athena is managing it for them. Any further questions out there? I think somewhere south, there was a question from Barry about whether the object tags are gonna be available or queried through the analytical apps. Um, I think it is, it is something that we need to uh, to assess. I know that our product team is nowadays working closely with the leaders of the data catalog and data governance solutions like, you know, them, Alation, Calibra, the Wearscape and the rest um, for being able to interpret those data tags and provide you out of the box much better visibility of the lineage and just additional metadata about the data you manage in Snowflake. So the integration would be happening. How quickly is it gonna appear in your BI tools? Um, that is a little bit hard to say. Mm -hmm. I just noticed another one from Alan in terms of virtualization of data vault layers. Is there any recommendation as to which layers are best to physicalize versus virtualize with the Snowflake? And my, my answer is always virtualize as many as you can. We do have customers that um, they have a raw vault and that they have a, maybe a persistent staging area, which is physical and a raw vault, which is physical, uh, but then everything else downstream, um, business vault and information marts are all virtualized. We did an office hours uh, last week, I think it was with uh, Indigo AG and that's what uh, they're doing there. Uh, Paculon that I've mentioned multiple times, yeah, they're, they're loading uh, JSON into a variant in a satellite and then everything downstream from there is views. So they haven't physicalized anything. And so that is, you know, I say my recommendation is always try views first. Um, forget the old school thinking of, oh, there's no way the views are going to perform with these kinds of joins and these kinds of queries. And we have actually absolutely, Snowflake's just blown that concept out of the water. Um, pretty much everybody I've been talking to still is, is using views. And from an agile perspective, it's way faster, right? You just can, you just can start doing new things uh, faster. Uh, hey, Mike, 
You're welcome. Glad glad you're here again, buddy. <laughs> I'm very glad your voice held out as well, Kent, for the for the talk. Yeah. Thanks. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, scrolling back through the notes. There was um, one from Paul English earlier on about. Uh, yeah, I will see another one too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, from John. Uh, when you say you want to eliminate Data Mart, are you proposing to use Business Vault Warehouse on top of the current data based on views, data share as a Data Mart? Um, I think there's a, there's a couple of options there. Uh, it, to a certain extent, yes, I am proposing for certain scenarios that you expose the Business Vault as the share, right? And I just trying to explain sharing to people. I always use the term curated data mart, right? I mean, you're just, it's just you're you're exposing a schema, a set of data that you have done governance and on, rather than just like raw flat files. Though people actually do do that. Do some people do actually expose their raw data ver, ver, via a share, uh, depending on the use case, like the log files I was talking about a minute ago. But my vision of this is at a minimum you know, most likely scenario is you would maybe share business vault views with other consumers. So you know that it's refined, some business rules have been applied rather than just, um, I, I generally wouldn't want to expose my raw vault to a random array of people, right? Because it just leaves too much open for interpretation uh, doing bridge tables or pit tables and not doing it correctly. Um, things of that nature. Um, I don't really see doing that through data sharing, but it is certainly possible.